Wisconsin and Madison. Hi, everyone. Um, if you have looked at the schedule, you may be a little bit confused my changing and evolving titles. <laughs> I actually decided to change what I was going to talk about uh, last night because I looked at uh, other talks that people were giving here at the workshop and I figured out that maybe uh, this work would be a better fit at least uh, to the current audience. If you came here expecting to hear about cyclic methods, um, I can actually talk about that offline. I also have that talk. I'm just not going to talk about it today. Okay, so the work that I'll talk is uh, joint work with uh, my student Pu Chen Wang, uh, Nico Zarifis, he's a PhD student with uh, Ilias, and Ilias with uh, whom I shared the last name by no accident. Uh, <laughs> this is actually the first time Ilias and I collaborated, uh, and we have been together for 10 years. The, paper got an oral presentation at ICML, so you know, not bad. Although uh, most credit should really go to Puchian and Nikos, who uh, really did most of the work on, on this uh, paper, and I'm very impressed with both of them. So let's uh, start with the setup. So uh, we are going to be working in the setup, which is known as agnostic learning of a single neuron. And now, uh, if you're not someone who comes with a learning theory background, probably many of these words don't make any sense. So what I'm going to do is now uh, introduce what all of this means. So certainly you know what linear regression would be. So, so here we are not doing linear regression anymore, but non-linear regression where um, after uh, doing a linear transformation, we have some kind of non-linearity. This W here is our model parameter vector, and the uh, this in here called a sigma represents what is known as an activation function or a link function, and uh, it can be a value that would be the most standard one. And actually, I'll mostly talk about values, but the work actually uh, results apply to much broader classes of activations, even including some non-monotone activations like a swish and gallop. Okay. Now, in terms of you know, what is learning part here, uh, we assume that uh, we are getting some label data and uh, it is drawn from some distribution that we do not know. Importantly, and why this is called agnostic model, we are not assuming anything about the labels. Okay, so, so there is no assumption that the data corresponds to any model whatsoever from our class. We are just trying to find the best one. Okay, so, so for example, if I'm talking about values, I'm trying to find the best value, the one that fits the data the best. Okay, you can also think about it as uh, there is some best vector and then there is noise, but this noise is uh, arbitrary. Uh, our goal and the reason why there was a word regression there is to approximately minimize the mean square loss of the model. Okay, so, so just uh, what we are assigning to the data minus the label. And this approximately, what it means we'll see in a little bit because uh, as you'll quickly find out, there isn't that much we can hope for. Let's see what we can actually do, what we can and cannot do. So let's say opt is the minimum possible value of this uh, mean squared loss. Now, if you are an optimizer and you're trying to minimize some loss function, ideally you would like to minimize that loss function to some additive error epsilon or multiplicative error one plus epsilon. If we are not making any distributional assumptions, even having error of the type constant times op plus epsilon is actually NP hard. And even stronger uh, claims can be made about improper learning where uh, in fact super polynomial time is required. Okay, so, so this tells us uh, even if all we are shooting for is constant times op plus epsilon, we need distributional assumptions. Now you can be thinking, okay, but what if I have some really, really nice distribution? In particular, what if I look at the nicest one of my distributions, just Gaussian? Well, 
Uh, even in that case, it's not working. <laughs> Uh, you cannot get additive epsilon. That requires super polynomial time. There are lower bounds that tell us that. So in terms of approximation, what we can hope for is getting results of the uh, type constant times opt plus epsilon under distributional assumptions. So, so both of these are required. Okay, so, so now if we go back to the problem statement, we assume we have sample access to some unknown but structured distribution. We have some error parameter epsilon, and I'll just confine my weight vectors to some uh, bounded set. Let's say it's an L2 ball of radius W. It doesn't really matter that much, but the goal is to find a parameter vector of norm at most w such that for an absolute constant, we want an absolute constant here. We do not want something that scales with dimension because otherwise it quickly becomes uninformative. Uh, we get error c times opt plus epsilon where, you know, again, opt is the minimum possible mean square loss. Okay, and I'll immediately jump to telling you what is the result. And then I'll go through more details about what was known and, and what we actually do here. So the main result is that under mild distributional assumptions, and I'll tell you precisely what those distributional assumptions are on the next slide, we can run mini batch stochastic gradient descent for some sufficiently large batch size, and I'll tell you specifically how large, and the sufficiently small step size, but again, not too small. Uh, we don't run it on the original problem. We run it on a surrogate problem, but we get guarantees for the original problem. We solve the problem such that for an absolute constant C, we get this uh, target error that we want, C times up plus epsilon. The number of iterations is log one over epsilon. The total number of samples that the algorithm uses is D times some function of one over epsilon. Uh, Quick remark, this D has to be there. Like even for much easier problems, like if you look at standard Gaussian variance scales with D, right? So this has to appear that this uh, F of one over epsilon depends on the concentration of one dimensional projections of the covariates. If you have sub-exponential concentration, it is a polylog in one over epsilon. If you have a heavy tailed distribution, if you have polynomial tails, we can make them too heavy, so, so the constant of the polynomial has to be at least four, then this is one over epsilon to two over k. So as uh, k grows large, this becomes, the whole thing becomes smaller. And this is always smaller than one over root epsilon. Okay. Any questions about the statement of the result? Okay. So, so let's see now what the distributional assumptions are. Uh, there are only two. What the first assumption you can think of as a margin length assumption. It can also be interpreted as a type of anti-concentration, but only in the direction of one good vector. Okay, so, so concretely what we assume is that there exists a parameter vector W star that gets error constant times opt, and that there are some two absolute constants, gamma and lambda, uh, such that this condition holds. Why is it a margin-like condition? Well, if you are familiar with classification, this kind of looks like a margin. Why is it uh, anti-concentration? That, that requires a few lines. But that's the first uh, assumption. The second assumption is uh, about concentration. And uh, in terms of uh, concentration, we just uh, assume if you project on any direction, the concentration is better than one over uh, t to the fourth. Okay. And then you see this for the first time and you're wondering, well, is this mild? Uh, it is. In fact, uh, these assumptions subsume everything that was known and that can achieve the same error guarantees. And in fact, it contains many more uh, distributions. Okay, so, so, so let me give you a more concrete comparison. So all 
prior work that could get an absolute constant times opt plus epsilon required all of the following assumptions. The first one is anti-concentration, uh, which roughly means that uh, if you look at uh, one-dimensional projections of the covariates, uh, there is no interval that uh, contains too much of your probability mass. Okay. And the reason this is not an ideal assumption to have is that uh, it rules out uh, data that is potentially lower dimensional. Uh, we relax this and we only need anti-concentration along one of the approximate solutions. Okay, there is concentration. And people, I assume, know what concentration is. So we want strong concentration around the mean. All prior work required at least sub-exponential concentration, which uh, rules out heavy tail distributions. And uh, we replace this with uh, by allowing even polynomial tails. The third assumption is what's called anti-anti-concentration. Uh, the reason you would not want to have an assumption like this is that it uh, rules out discrete distributions. Anti-anti-concentration uh, bounds the probability density below, so it doesn't allow you to have uh, any gaps in your probability ma mass. So, so, so there, is, there are no regions where you're not placing any probability. Okay? That assumption we completely remove. Okay, so, so, so clearly these are much weaker distributional assumptions. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about related work. Uh, it, it, it will be important for what we will discuss when we go to main ideas. So there are two main lines of work. Uh, the first line of work is uh, applying algorithms like stochastic gradient descent or gradient descent on the empirical version directly to this uh, loss to the squared loss, which is what you're trying to minimize. And uh, the way the results are proved is that, well, if you're running things like stochastic gradient descent, you're guaranteed to converge to a stationary point, so you prove a stationary point is good enough. Uh, it, it's very nice. It's a very, very natural approach. Um, it would be nice to prove such results under the distributions that we handle. It appears quite challenging, and so far, all the results that uh, do things like this, they, they require really strong distributional assumptions. Okay, the second line of uh, work is uh, for minimizing a convex surrogate of the problem, and this is what we do, and I'll tell you more about it uh, soon. Uh, in terms of the results that actually get an absolute constant uh, times opt plus epsilon, uh, only two of these uh, works do that, and uh, they actually do not handle any non-monotone activations, which are handled in our work. And, uh, well, the final thing, I guess, that should always be a sanity check, when we specialize our results to the setups that were handled by prior work, uh, the sample complexity, computational complexity are not any higher. They're often much lower, like going from poly 1 over epsilon to poly log 1 over epsilon. So I'll go to the main ideas, unless there are any questions. Okay. So, so I mentioned that uh, there are two main approaches, looking at the original squared loss and looking at the convex circuit. And, and some you know, very basic things uh, that you can say about uh, these two types of loss functions. Well, the original squared loss is non-convex, even if you look at just value. And value is your most basic activation function. Uh, it is what, you're, what you want to minimize. So obviously, a minimizer is a solution. But a stationary point is not a minimizer in general. So uh, doing things like that are gradient descent-like are not guaranteed to give you uh, good approximate solutions. The convex surrogate that uh, we end up working with has actually been used quite a bit on uh, similar problems in uh, learning theory. It was introduced back in 1995. Uh, I know it may look a little bit strange at first. Uh, you should think about what happens when you differentiate it. It starts looking quite similar to what appears under the squared loss. Uh, 
th there is a better motivation that one can also talk about through child parameters, but that's for a much more specialized audience, so I chose not to talk about that. So, so this uh, surrogate is convex for any monotone activation. Uh, the minimizer may not be the solution. So, so there, there is no guarantee if you're just generically minimizing this, you get the solution. You need to prove more results, but it is convex, so, so gradient descent will be converging to the minimizer. Okay. Now, the key property that we prove and uh, that enables both this constant times opt plus epsilon error and uh, this very low sample and computational complexity is provided in this lemma. So, so what is this lemma saying? Uh, if we are making the distributional assumptions that we are making, there is a set S and an absolute constant mu uh, such that the inner product of the gradient of the surrogate loss with W minus W star is bounded below by a quadratic. So you can think of this as a growth condition. Uh, in optimization, things like this are known as local error bounds. Uh, we call it sharpness in our paper. It's not exactly sharpness. So sharpness would mean that uh, loss of W minus loss of W star is bounded below by a quadratic. Uh, sharpness would imply this. This is a slightly weaker property. Things like this certainly called for strongly convex functions. Uh, but this does not imply that the function is strongly convex. It's a weaker property. Isn't it PL? Huh? PL. Uh, isn't it PL? Isn't it the PL condition? Mm, so PL would bound... Z-cash inequality, restricted Z-cash, I think they call it. Uh, probably there are other names in the literature, but PL, I don't see why it's immediately this becomes PL because... Z can't inequality restricted. Probably. Name is not that important. Let's put it that way. I guess what I'm saying is people have proven stuff under the, this RSI condition, they call it. Excellent. So, so let me comment on that a little bit too. Uh, so things like local error bounds, where you are bounding some kind of residual function by distance to the optimum, uh, these have been studied in optimization theory for a very long time. Uh, since the 1950s. Uh, in standard optimization theory, people have usually looked at very broad classes of problems uh, and, uh, you know, proved even that things like this hold generically. The main issue is that this constant here in those lower bounds is usually not a constant. It can be exponentially small. Uh, there are very, very few examples where you get an absolute constant uh, some examples come in uh, problems like matrix sensing and I think maybe even matrix completion where there are similar local error bounds that hold. But, but it is very, very rare. Now, you're probably wondering now, okay, but what is this set S? Because it may be useless. Uh, so the set S is a ball centered at zero of radius 2W star, but it excludes another ball around W star. So, so it has this hole inside it. And uh, this hole, actually inside this hole, uh, all the points have C times opt error for a constant C that depends on mu, but mu is an absolute constant, so, so we are fine. Okay, so, so what will the actual argument look like? So, so if you look at the whole region, this is a region in which you can show that uh, mini batch SGD would contract distance by a constant factor. Now, if you know about stochastic optimization, this is not immediate from things like sharpness because the variance would be preventing you from doing that. But uh, what we show is that for a sufficiently large batch size, your variance of gradient estimates scales with the distance to opt squared. So, so you actually do get a contraction in this region. In this other region, all the points have error C times opt. So, so then, you know, the basic argument is quite simple. You start at zero, uh, you are in the bigger region. So when you're moving, you're contracting the distance. At some point you stepped into this uh, 
target region. You don't know exactly when this happens, right? And once inside this region, you may stay in or you may step out. But what we show is if you step out, you won't go far. So there is slightly larger ball where you would still have a constant C times up. So after log one over epsilon iterations, you're always within a ball where your error is uh, constant times up plus epsilon. Yes. Is this double your star unique? Like because uh, it is not unique. We do not assume that it is unique. We do not assume even that the properties that I stated hold for every W star, only that there is one for which it holds. Doesn't matter which one, just that there is one. Okay. So what we get are error guarantees, constant times up plus epsilon for agnostic learning of a single neuron and uh, the results apply to a large class of activations and a much larger class of distributions than what was handled in prior work. The algorithm is both sample and computationally efficient. We recover all prior results of a similar flavor and actually improve over some of them and handle many more distributions. Uh, and as I said, we also handle some non-monotone activations like Galu and Swish that were not handled by prior work. A couple of open questions. So, so the first one is that uh, this property called the sharpness or local error bound is very powerful, but you need to be able to prove it with the parameter, with that constant mu that is large enough. Otherwise, it's not very useful. Now, we already have a few examples of uh, machine learning problems where we know how to prove such bounds. So maybe there is a broader phenomenon. Maybe they're also telling us something about the problems, that problems that are learnable perhaps have a very strong signal in the data which would make sense at an intuitive level. Uh, other open questions, of course, concern going beyond a single neuron. So uh, let's say, can we handle a sum of values? And uh, even though it seems like a mild generalization, uh, actually the problem becomes much more challenging. And uh, even like for positive linear combinations of values, uh, there are no polynomial time algorithms. That are known. I think there are not even known polynomial time algorithms for sums of values in the realizable case without any noise. So that would be interesting. Now, since I have more time, I can tell you a little bit more about proving sharpness, but I want to first pause to see if there are any uh, questions. Uh, does your algorithm need to know mu for the sharpness? No. Okay. It does not. Well, let me see. Um, it may need to know it to set the batch size, but in practice it wouldn't matter. So, so the mu is not a constant that we just show us methodically. Like we actually give a very concrete uh, bound on it uh, based on distributional assumptions. I'm trying to remember. Um, but yeah, even if it does, like this is a thing because mu only would play a role in the batch size and the step size, which are things that people tune in practice anyway. But what if you don't start in this region S? Like, imagine that you have initialization that is like close to some other solutions. What would would you go to direction to this different W star or? It's unclear. So, so what is very important about these uh, results is that we initialize at zero. So because we're initializing at zero, we are guaranteed to be in the set. Okay, I got so, it. So, so yeah. that's the, it. Yeah, yeah, that's the trick. Okay, but the question you should be asking me is like, how do you prove this sharpness problem? And uh, since I have, I think, four more minutes, I could go over that. And uh, I'll, I'll do a simplified uh, proof. 
that is uh, just going to apply to ReLU. Is it simple enough to, to discuss? Uh, here are the distributional assumptions at the top. And uh, I'm going to prove sharpness for the idealized noise-free surrogates. So, so why is it idealized? Uh, in the actual noise surrogate for which we can compute gradients, uh, here you would have the label. This is something you don't know. Uh, however, so, so what we're going to prove is sharpness of this thing on the entire ball without that exclusion. Uh, that exclusion, that, that hollow part, happens when you relate this to this idealized uh, surrogate to the actual computable circuit. Okay, so, so let's see how to prove sharpness for this. So let's just start by writing things down. If you uh, differentiate this, uh, what you will be left with will be uh, the difference of the two sigmas multiplying x times w minus w star, you just put x inside and it looks like this. Okay, I, I trust this is something you all can do in, in like 30 seconds. Uh, now, the sigma is a monotone function. So, in fact, if I put the absolute value here, uh, this still holds just by monotonicity. Okay. So, because now everything is uh, non negative under the expectation, uh, if I condition on uh, this event, I, I surely have that inequality, right? I'm just throwing away something that is uh, no negative. Okay. Now let's see what to do next. So now I'm going to split this into two possible cases where uh, W dot X is uh, no negative and where it is negative. Okay, so far so good. I, I have a value here. So value equals its argument when the argument is non-negative and it's zero when the argument is negative. Okay. So, so now if you, so, so because of this conditioning, I know exactly what uh, value looks like, right? So the first term is uh, just going to be this difference squared. The other term is going to have W star dot X times this. Now look here for a second. If this event had some non-trivial probability mass, I could kind of ignore it and just look at this. And then my first margin-like condition would exactly give me what they want. It would be some uh, constant times lambda times W minus W star squared. Okay, it's just, just from the first condition up there has the same conditioning. But, but the issue here now is that I don't know uh, what the mass of this event would be. Right, so, so I need to consider both. So what happens in the rest of the proof is that you look at this other case and you argue using concentration that this W star dot X uh, is bounded below by a constant times w dot x minus w star dot x. Why is this true? So in this case, w dot x and w star dot x, they have different signs. So their difference is actually the sum of absolute values. Now, this is going to be a constant fraction of that difference uh, if this is not too negative. But this cannot become too negative due to concentration. And that's the basic idea. And then you're done because uh, you get that uh, this is a constant times, uh, uh, times the quadratic difference. You have uh, two complementary events. You multiply this one by the same constant. You're just relaxing, sum them up, use the first condition, and you're done. So that's the whole point. How you generalize the different question. Okay, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Any other questions for the other one? So you mentioned at some point that you can do this for non monotone sigmas as well. Okay, so how different the proof is then? It's 
uh, it requires you to be it, uh, requires you to be more um, careful in, in how you are uh, handling all, all these uh, different quantities because uh, some of them may become negative, but so you need to ensure that they are dominated by positive terms. Okay, so there will be some extra assumptions then. So Thanks. there are assumptions on the activation functions. There are no additional assumptions about the distributions. I, I guess more precise. Uh, more, more precisely, you're saying like the amount of non-monotonicity you can tolerate is some function of the other parameters in your problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you just absorb them. For this thing. I was just trying to get some intuition behind this anti-concentration bound. Like, if X is just a random, like, isotropic Gaussian and W is just some fixed unit vector, like, mm -hmm. don't we expect that event to very rarely happen? Like, uh, I don't, wouldn't we expect this expectation to be very small because it's rare that I would get a vector that's pointing in a constant fraction in the direction of some fixed vector W star? Like, why is lambda not scaling, like, as 1 over root D or 1 over D or something? Um, Maybe I'm just misunderstanding it. No, but, but uh, here you are actually, so, so if there was just a zero on the other side, you would be looking at the whole half space, right? Yeah. Uh, here you are uh, just uh, reducing that space by a little, but there is still a quite a non-trivial mass. So, so you, can, uh, you okay. can argue not just for Gaussians, any isotropic lock concaves, you can argue for discrete Gaussians, you can argue for... Um, so even when gamma is like some constant or something? It, it is actually, we provide the specific uh, constant in the paper. So, so all of these are derived for all these special cases. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> all right, let's thank uh, Yana Nanya.